Good morning. It is about 10.20 on Thursday the 15th, and we're going to try this video lecture again since yesterday the power went out. Uh, today's topic is the early republic, the era of federalists and good feelings. And this is really going to talk about what happens in the first 20 years or so once the, the Constitution is passed. And we have the federalist era first, and this is really going to be the first president, George Washington, and the second president, John Adams. All right, so Washington is going to be elected president. He is completely unopposed. Nobody is going to go against him. Uh, that's pre-planned from the beginning. John Adams will end up being the first vice president. Now, most men who are elected to Congress come from the Federalist camp, the ones that we talked about that wrote the Federalist Papers. Uh, a few anti-Federalists are elected, but not many. Now, George Washington, of course, he was the commander of the colonial army. He had been a very wealthy individual person from Virginia for years. Uh, he had served with the British Army, and um, he's very cautious on everything he does. Uh, he knows that everything he's doing is being looked at, that this great American experiment may or may not survive. And, I mean, he doesn't even know what to call himself. And people say, well, you should be king. And he says, no, 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 just call me Mr. President. Don't say your highness, your majesty, majesty, nothing like that. And then, you know, well, do we bow to you or do we do something else? He says, no, just shake my hand. And so he's going to be treated just like, you know, a regular person, basically. Now, Washington is going to create the first cabinet. And the first cabinet is going to have Alexander Hamilton, a Broadway fame. He's the first secretary of the treasury. Edmund Randolph is going to be the first attorney general, which is basically the head attorney for the country. Henry Knox is going to be the first secretary of the of war, which is today the secretary of defense. And then you got Thomas Jefferson, who is the head diplomat, the secretary of state. And then Samuel Osgood is the postmaster general. Uh, today, most people don't even know who the postmaster is. Uh, it's um, his name's DeJoy right now, but back in you know 1798 or 1789 whatever you want to say uh the postmaster general was extremely important that was how news traveled from one end of the country to the other as far as the legislature goes the first order of business is to amend the constitution remember there were four states who would not sign the constitution unless a bill of rights were were guaranteed and when congress sits down they immediately pass 12 amendments. Of those 12 amendments, 10 go into the Constitution. And those 10 become known as the Bill of Rights that we have today. So that's freedom of religion, freedom of press, freedom of speech, the right to bear arms, protection from search and seizure, all those rights that we talk about. There was an 11th Amendment that was passed and eventually entered into the Constitution, but it doesn't pass until 1992, even though it was one of the first 12 amendments that were proposed and passed. It's not actually ratified until 1992, and it was about how Congress got pay increases. Uh, the judiciary, that's the third branch of the government, and it's created through the Judiciary Act of 1789. That's how the court system is established. Now, the gentleman that's in this picture, that is John Jay. He was one of the people who wrote the Federalist Papers, and he's going to become the first Supreme Court Justice uh, to, well, I should say, this first Chief Justice of the Supreme Court. Uh, as originally put into place, there were five Associate Justices, one Chief Justice. Today, there are eight Associate Justices, but still only one Chief Justice. Below that, there are three courts of appeal, and then there are 13 district courts that are created as well. Now, this entire court system is based off of Article 3 of the Constitution, and it's the Judiciary Act of 1789 that puts the court system into action. All right, uh, George Washington, there was some drama. Um, a lot of it had to do with Alexander Hamilton. Um, Alexander Hamilton, he had a kind of a different view on constitutional powers. 
uh, he really leaned into the idea of the necessary and proper clause. Basically, anything that the government thinks is necessary and proper for the running of the government, the government could create. And so Alexander Hamilton says, you know what, we need a national bank. We need a bank that will handle all of our funds. We need a bank that will uh, act as a clearinghouse where money can be exchanged. And so Alexander Hamilton, he does that. And not only does he do that, but he takes all of the debts from the different states and make them part of the national debt. And then from this national bank, Alexander Hamilton will start to pay off the war debts, he will raise money, and he will establish the American currency. He also convinces Congress to pass an excise tax. An excise tax is a use tax or a luxury tax. This is going to lead to a failed rebellion in 1794 called the Whiskey Rebellion. Uh, Western Pennsylvania, there were a lot of whiskey distillers there. They didn't want to pay extra taxes. They didn't think it was fair. So they're going to revolt and the army is going to put this down. And the Whiskey Rebellion, it's, it's a failure, but it really gets people to kind of say, wait a minute, um, this isn't going to work the way we're doing it and we need to listen to everybody. In the end, the the um, tax is lowered and everybody is happy. All right, we're going to get partisan politics. Now, this is not like true political parties yet that is going to develop in a couple of years. These are like two different factions who have opposing ideas. The Federalist Party are going to be mostly from New England. They're going to be people who think that there are a lot of enemies that the country has and they want law, stability, order. They don't trust the masses. And on the other side, we're going to have Republicans. Now, these are not the same Republicans we have today. Today's Republican Party is going to be created in the 1850s. These are going to be Jeffersonian Republicans who eventually become known as Jeffersonian Democrats and eventually uh, Jacksonian Democrats. Uh, these are really people who believe in um, the rural area. They believe in farmers. They think that the U.S. is going to be just fine. They don't think that there are a lot of enemies. But the points of view of these two different partisan groups start to grow further and further apart. And they start to fight with each other. And more than anything else, it is this partisan politic that is going to keep George Washington from enrolling or trying for or running for a third term, however you want to put it. So with George Washington out of the way, we have our second president, and this is going to be Mr. John Adams. Now, the way the system used to work was a little different than today. Uh, there was no vice presidential candidate. Uh, you ran for president, and whoever got the most electoral college votes became president. Whoever got the second most electoral college votes became vice president. And in this election, John Adams gets the most votes. Thomas Jefferson gets the second most votes. Now, what's really interesting about this is Adams is a Federalist. Jefferson is a Republican. They don't get along very well because of this. And in some cases, Jefferson actively works against Adams. Now, there's some drama while John Adams is president, too. Uh, the biggest one is really the XYZ affair, as it becomes known. And in 1797, John Adams is going to send a diplomatic mission to France. Uh, France is in the middle of a revolution, and things have been a mess for about 10 years in France. And the French government's running out of money by 1797. Well, the mission is met with three French agents, Agent X, Y, and Z. And these three French agents are going to demand that the U.S. pay them a large bribe, something like $250,000. Then they say that the French government is going to ask for a $12 million loan. The Americans refuse. News of this gets out and everybody gets angry. Uh, John Adams is going to ask Congress to increase the size of the army, rebuild the navy, and really from 1798 to 1800, there's a, there's a war being fought between 
the United States and France. It's just not officially declared. Um, George Washington is going to offer to come out of retirement and lead the forces against France. But John Adams knew that the United States wasn't ready for war, and he kind of starts doing some secret negotiations, and uh, things calm down. In 1800, a guy named Napoleon is going to come to power in France. A new diplomatic mission is sent, and Napoleon agrees to stop the fighting, and a war is going to be avoided. Another thing is happening at the same time, 1798, the Federalists and John Adams just decide that they want to get rid of their political opponents, they want to get rid of their Republican faction. So the Alien Act is going to be passed, and that's directed at immigrants. Uh, what the Alien Act is, it made it harder to become a U.S. citizen. Originally, you just had to live in the United States for five years to be a citizen. The Alien Acts increase it to 14. It also gave the, the president the power to deport or imprison any immigrant that they thought was dangerous. The Sedition Act is going to be similarly harsh. Uh, in fact, the Sedition Act made it a crime for anyone to write or say anything insulting about the government, being the president, Congress, or the government in general. You know, both of these were geared towards getting rid of the Republican faction. A lot of the aliens or the immigrants who came into the United States, they sided with the Republican faction. And the Sedition Act is going to stop people from writing against the government. And uh, both of them are very an anti-democratic and they are going to be uh, done away with fairly quickly. In response to the Alien Sedition Acts, uh, the Virginia and Kentucky resolutions will be passed. The Virginia and Kentucky resolutions were written by James Madison and Thomas Jefferson, and they are purely to uh, complain about what is going on with the federal government. Uh, they argue that citizens speak through their states by electing state representatives and the state government, and therefore it's up to the states to decide if something is constitutional or not. Um, the resolutions, they were really just propaganda. They didn't really have any bite or anything like that, but it was enough to make people say, well, maybe the states have rights, and this idea of states' rights gets bigger and bigger and bigger until it becomes one of the contributing factors to the American Civil War. It's going to lead to the idea of nullification. It's going to lead to the idea of secession. The Virginia and Kentucky resolutions that were written in like 1799 or 1800, they're going to linger, or at least their ideas are going to linger for the next 60 years. All right, moving on to the era of good feelings. This is going to be Thomas Jefferson, James Madison, and James Monroe. Thomas Jefferson and Adams are going to face each other in the election of 1800. And just like before, the person who gets the most votes gets president. The person who gets the second most votes gets vice president. Well, they think they figured it out. Uh, John Adams picks a running mate. Thomas Jefferson picks a running mate. And the Electoral College says, okay, we'll give the primary candidate so many votes and we'll give the secondary candidate so many votes minus one. So for the those who vote for the Federalist faction, John Adams gets 65 votes, Charles Pickney gets 64, it looks okay. Uh, problem is though, Thomas Jefferson gets 73 Electoral College votes. It's more than John Adams. John Adams cannot be president. The trouble begins when Aaron Burr also gets 73 Electoral College votes. So Jefferson and Burr are tied. In baseball, the tie goes to the runner. In government politics, it doesn't work that way. They have to do more elections. Uh, but in presidential elections, if the Electoral College ties, or if there's neither candidate who gets enough Electoral College votes, then it's decided by Congress. And so there were 36 tie-breaking votes in Congress 
before Jefferson is eventually going to be declared the winner of the 1800 election. Aaron Burr does become vice president. Now, when Jefferson becomes president, he appeals for unity. He wants people to stop fighting, never mind the fact that he was one of the main people who were causing it. He's going to use patronage to put people in office, basically people who supported him, he gives jobs to. And then he gets Congress to repeal the Judiciary Act of 1801. Um, he basically says it's too expensive to have the courts running all the time, 365 days of the year. So he sets up a court schedule where courts only meet certain times of the year. And last but not least, he repeals the Alien Sedition Act since they were primarily geared towards him and his political faction. What do you need to know about Jefferson's presidency? Well, you've already read about Marbury versus Madison, so you know the idea of judicial review. You know that the Supreme Court can decide if something is constitutional or not. And this is all because William Marbury sued the government to make sure that he got his position as a judge. Well, it turns out he sued in the wrong court. He was supposed to start at district court. He went straight to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court looks at the Constitution and says, it's not our decision to make. The biggest thing he does, both literally and figuratively, is the Louisiana Purchase. Uh, by the early 1800s, Napoleon is in charge of France, and he's looking to make a sale so he can gain money. And the French have a, a reacquired, I'll say, some land in North America. Now, yes, they were banished from North America after the Seven Years' War, but Napoleon took over Spain, Spain gave land to France, and what do you know, Napoleon's back into France's back in America. Well, Napoleon realizes he can't use all this land, so he decides to sell it, and the United States is going to buy 827,000 square miles of land from France for $15 million. Now, to give you an idea of how much land this was, the Louisiana Purchase made up all or parts of the following states. Louisiana, Arkansas, Missouri, Iowa, Minnesota, North Dakota, South Dakota, uh, Kansas, Nebraska, Oklahoma, Colorado, Wyoming, Montana, a little bit of Idaho, and um, a little bit of Texas as well. So it's a lot of land gathered for pennies on the acre. Now Jefferson, he wants to know what we've bought. And so he sends two very famous adventurers, a guy named Lewis and a guy named Clark, to go and explore. They go down the Ohio River until it meets the Mississippi. And then they find the Missouri River and they take the Missouri River until where it ends. And then they go overland a little bit. They find the Columbia River. They take the Columbia River to the to the Pacific Ocean and say, yep, it's an ocean. And then they turn around and they go back to Washington, D.C. to explain what they found. The entire way, I think it's William Clark is the, the artist, and there's they sketch everything they see. There's also a famous Native American woman named Sacagawea who went part of the way with them, uh, and she becomes really one of the major figures of... Um, of women's history. Another part of the Louisiana Purchase is going to be studied and explored by Zebulon Pike. Zebulon Pike is going to go into Colorado, he's going to go into parts of Wyoming, he's going to go into New Mexico, and very famously Pike's Peak, a mountain in Colorado, is named after him. Now Jefferson, he runs and wins two terms. He does not run for a third he looks at, at uh, George Washington as his inspiration. And if George didn't run for third term, I'm not going to run for third term either. But his personal choice, his Secretary of State, is going to become the next president, James Madison. James Madison defeats Charles Pickney and George Clinton of New York pretty easily. It's like 120 electoral college votes to about 50. And then um, George Clinton, I think, gets five or six. 
All right, so what do you need to know about James Madison? Primarily the War of 1812. There are many causes of the War of 1812, primarily the impressment of American sailors. Uh, what this means is the British Navy was stopping American ships, boarding them, and taking sailors and claiming that they were runaway British soldiers and sailors and everything else. They weren't. They were Americans, but the British were needing workers for their Navy. Also, in 1807, the USS Chesapeake is fired on by British ships uh, because... Um, they didn't recognize at first it was an American ship, but even after they did, they continued firing at it, and this U.S. naval ship almost sinks. The U.S. Chesapeake is almost sunk by the British Navy. Now, last but not least, there were some attempts by the British to cut off trade with the United States, and the United States doesn't want to do a lot of business in, in Europe at this time. And... The Embargo Act of 1807 is going to be passed, and then the Non-Intercourse Act of 1809 is going to be passed. These are attempts to stop trade with Britain, and they're going to fail, and, and um, people start to get really angry, and people are going to demand war with Britain. Um, the United States is going to declare war on June of or in June of 1812. They're not ready, not prepared, no army to speak of, no supplies. Doesn't matter though. James Madison goes to Congress and says, we need to fight Britain. And Britain says, no, you don't. And the American government says, yes, we will. We will fight you. Here's a declaration of war. Now, there's the army is very ill equipped. It's very small. It's basically a trained militia, but hey, What's the worst that could happen? Uh, at one point, the United States is going to invade Canada. It's an embarrassment. Uh, another thing that happens is Britain invades Baltimore and then burns down the freshly painted and brand new White House. There's some fighting in the Caribbean. There's some fighting on the uh, Great Lakes. And in the end, it's really going to be a draw. Uh, nobody wins. The United States is going to stay independent and Britain's going to say, that's what you get, even though they were hurt just as bad. Really, the absolute biggest thing that comes out of this is that the Native American resistance in the eastern part of the country is crushed. Uh, the Shawnee leaders, Tecumseh and Prophet, had sided with the British. And so the American army is going to fight them in Indiana at a place called Tippecanoe Creek in 1811. And uh, Tecumseh and Prophet are going to be defeated, and there's no more resistance east of the Mississippi River. Uh, closer to home, the Creek Nation is going to be uh, defeated by Andrew Jackson in 1814 at the Battle of Horseshoe Bend. And that's going to open up the way for the Creeks and the Cherokee and everybody else to be removed from the United States into reservations. While the War of 1812 is going on, there were many people, primarily members of the Federalist Party, who think that the war is going to be lost because the United States isn't doing great. And they meet in Hartford, Connecticut, and they plan on rewriting the Constitution and preparing for when the Union loses, they can build a new country. Well, the war ends, and people aren't expecting this. And everybody who's in attendance at the Hartford Convention, it looks like they're plotting against the country, and they look like traitors. And because they're all Federalists, the Federalists are painted to be traitors, and nobody wants to be part of a, a traitorous party. And so the, the Federalist faction dies off because they're caught in the middle of this treason. All right, the last thing about this lecture, uh, there's this thing called the first American system. This is going to be the plan to rebuild the country after the War of 1812. And there's really three names that are doing this. John C. Calhoun, who's from South Carolina, Henry Clay, who is from Kentucky, and then President Madison, who I think was from Virginia. Uh, the idea between behind the first American system is to strengthen the American economy, strengthen the American government, they're going to recharter the national bank so that there is a national clearinghouse. They're going to raise taxes on imported goods, which is called a tariff. And then they're going to 
encourage Americans to buy American goods, which will grow American industry. Clay, Calhoun, and Madison all agree on that. Where there's a little bit of a difference, though, Clay and Calhoun wanted the federal government to build roads and build canals and build bridges. Uh, James Madison says, no, that's the job of the states. One court case worth mentioning is McCullough versus Maryland of 1819. Uh, Maryland placed a tax on any bank that was not chartered within the state of Maryland, meaning it wasn't founded and headquartered in Maryland. And when the National Bank tried to open up a branch in Maryland, Maryland taxed the National Bank. Um, the National Bank and Congress is going to... How do I want to put this? Um... I guess I say they sued. They sued themselves. The federal government is going to sue the state of Maryland, and the idea is that only Congress can stop the national bank. And because Congress authorized the national bank to exist, Maryland can't do anything about it. And in the end, um, Maryland is found to be guilty of putting an unfair tax or an illegal tax on the national bank. And what this do, did is it established that the uh, state law is subservient to federal law. There are layers, and the federal law is above the state law. Uh, the Monroe Doctrine is going to be passed by James Monroe shortly after this. And the James Monroe, uh, his goal in the Monroe Doctrine is to basically say the Western Hemisphere is closed. There's no further... Uh, chance of colonization. Even the United States couldn't really back that up. Um, Europe stays to their side of the world. The United States stays on its side of the world. And that is pretty much the status quo all the way up until 1914 when World War I happens. Uh, let's see. There's a, a, there's a stock market crash in 1819 because of the end of the war and that Stock market crash is going to last until 1823. And then also, last but not least, Michigan, not Michigan, but Missouri, is going to end up with enough people in it to become a state. And the people of Missouri want to become a slave state. But slavery is technically banned in the area where Missouri is. So Henry Clay from Kentucky is going to come up with the Missouri Compromise. He's going to, he's going to say, okay, we will let slavery into Missouri, but from now on, no matter what, there will be no slavery north of the southern border of Missouri. And that that uh, Missouri Compromise is really only going to stay in place for a couple of years. All right, that's it for this first video. I'm going to take just a short little pause, and I'm going to make a second video for you guys. And um, if you have any questions, as always, just send me an email, and uh, I'll get back to you as quick as I can. Thanks for watching.